to me, it was about visual design. Because every time I look at those guys. You um, mean the Gumby people? Yeah, the Gumby people. I want to take my eyeballs out every time I see them. So. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to another epic legendary episode, the 75th episode of Off the Cuff. And we have an amazing guest today. You won't believe it. You will believe it when you hear it. If you're listening to us in Anchor and Spotify, or you're watching us here on YouTube, we're talking about the importance of visual design, and there is no one better in when it comes to learning design, e-learning, learning experience design, going back many years, back in the day, and still here doing some awesome stuff, then Connie Malamed. Hi, Connie. How are you? Hey, Alexander. I'm fine. I'm, I'm still here doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're very active, for sure. I've seen that. So, hey, uh, Connie, I know that we're talking about a topic that is very... Uh, you know, pretty much in the essence of what you do, uh, the importance of visual design to for learning and learning design, period. You know, I recently posted something on LinkedIn that uh, was kind of interesting. I see a lot of these folks that are, are you know, experts, uh, you know, thought experts or whatever. What do they call them? Thought expert. Yeah. Thought leader. <laughs> leaders. There you go. Leaders. <laughs> and uh they always pick this guys that are like the marshmallow kids, you know, the marshmallow little boy, uh, men, <laughs> whatever. That and they put them in the, you know, and you can just do a search and find them with like leadership, teamwork, and stuff like that. And I put a post on that. It went over five thousand or, or probably like five thousand views wow. already because you know it just happens a lot. And a lot of people had different opinions on that. And it's to me, it was about visual design because every time I look at those guys. You mean the Gumby people? Yeah, the Gumby people. I want to take my eyeballs out every time I see them. So <laughs> I know you're laughing. But <laughs> what do you think about that? I mean, what do Gumby you people? I don't know where they came from. They don't appeal to me. There's a certain amount of visual design that is subjective. And uh, the Gumby people, I just, I just don't get them. They don't do it for me, but obviously some people like them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So... Let's talk about your background. I mean, obviously, there's many people that know you already. You're a learning coach, right? Right. Uh, that's one thing. And uh, tell me a little bit, because I hear from different people in the industry when I talk, you know, we talked about you, you know, in, in, in passing. Uh, I know David Anderson, uh, training director, articulate. He's like, oh, man, Connie, she was doing it back when she was just doing blogs and, you know, like a page or something. I mean, we're talking. So... Give us a little of that background. How does that happen? Me. How do you get an L&D? Okay. Yeah. You know, I always liked um, designing uh, instructional materials. So that's how I first got in. And we've gone so far beyond that now. But that was the first way I got into it. I grew up with a mentally handicapped brother. And I think my mother was always trying to come up with unique ways to teach him. He was a musician. and um, But couldn't take care of himself. And so she would teach him with, um, she would sing multiplication tables to him. And I just kind of really got interested in learning. I think that might have done it. Uh, just watching all of the different techniques that she used. So anyway, I was an art major, art education major. That's where the art thing came in. Wasn't particularly good in art. But design, I found to be kind of more my thing. It was a little bit easier. You didn't have to render things and make them look, you know, good. So it, that kind of worked out. And then I just went to, uh, got real interested in learning and went to graduate school in um, instructional design in Austin at, at UT. Oh, okay. And uh, when I got into the field and the internet happened, I saw that a lot of people back then, I don't think it's true now, a lot of people back then didn't have cognitive psychology in their background like we had gotten it in um, school. So I thought I would just start writing some stuff about that. That's when I started the blog at, in uh, 2009, 10 years old. Wow. 350 articles at least. So, yeah, it's been yeah. a long time. Nice. Yeah, and, uh, pretty much 11 at this point, right? <laughs> yeah, thanks for the math uh, fix there. <laughs> yeah, not going to let you get away with that one. <laughs> no, I kind of forgot what year we were in. <laughs> Good. So is it really interesting you mentioned that people have different backgrounds, right? And the, 
they come into this job. And obviously there has been, uh, we can now see a spectrum of whatever instructional design is, uh, what an instructional design does because of the change in technology. Do you think that the instructional designer is an artist? I do think the instructional designer is a designer and okay. I differentiate between design and art. And I think it's good for people to think of themselves as designers so they can read design blogs. And it's not just visual design, but you're really coming up with, you know, designing learning experiences that are very learner centered. It's quite different than, you know, when I first got into the field. And I think that's what keeps me here. It's just so exciting that everything keeps changing. I love that. Mm. Um, but I do think that uh, the creativity that comes in that we need in our field comes from people thinking of themselves as designers and taking the path that designers take everyone should have a for example everyone should have a sketchbook and a pencil on their desk that's just part of being a designer right that kind of thing just okay. thinking of yourself that way yeah so i i find myself often uh you know a anywhere i go well if we go anywhere anymore <laughs> uh, where I go kind of observing the world and seeing where things can fit and how I mm -hmm. use them. Do you do that? You do that too? Yeah. And I really recommend that you mean just like looking around and yeah, just like, you know, uh, like maybe just seeing how, why things were made a specific way. Like if, if you see a cool car or if you see, you know, I guess a door or something or a park. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what I really like to observe all around me, well, of course, it's so good to remember that every object that we see was designed by a person, you know, and, and it started as an idea. I just think that's fascinating. It started as an idea, and then it went through all these iterations, and now you see it and you're using it. I just find that fascinating. I forget what I was going to say before that, but anyway. <laughs> I know, it's, it's, it's the fascination that got you there. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about visual design. Yeah, go ahead. You got it. I just remember one thing I love to observe is the user interface around the world. Um, uh, okay. so how do elevators work? Right. Um, you know, of course the user interface on, uh, digital things too, but also just all around us, we've got, we're interacting and interfacing with our surroundings and our environment. And that user interface is fascinating. I'll often take a picture and, you know, um, of it and post it somewhere and say, look at this user interface. They should have done it this way. Or, wow, what a great idea. You know? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, f I, f I find that a lot too. Uh, you know, I always laugh because people uh, may post some things on social media and they're like, I got this new phone and Man, it's been like three hours. Can't figure it out. The settings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's your there's your uh, UX for you. <laughs> so, so true. Someone use UX for that. <laughs> so, let me ask you then, uh, visual design. What you know? What what's so important about it? What are we using in a learning design? Do you see that it's getting better? Do you see that it needs to be still upfront? Uh, you know, how's that work? Okay. Well. The, um, the aesthetics of whatever it is, if we are creating an experience that involves visuals, the aesthetics are, are important because they allow people to process the information either very well, or if the visual design is poor, then it really screws up what people need to process. Uh, they don't know where to look, they um, get confused. There are distracting elements. So those are some reasons that aesthetics are important, but also um, they add to the professionalism and credibility of whatever it is that you're doing. If you see something that looks very dated, maybe from the 80s, like if I go to a website that truly looks like it's from, well, let's just say the 90s now, I, um, I probably leave right away. I just go, oh, it's not gonna be good information. It's, it's just too uh, messy and it, it doesn't reflect clear thinking. So just the visual design, including, you know, how the text is spaced, um, how wide the margins are, is something easy to read. All of that influences 
the feeling and motivation that people have about something. Okay. So you mentioned a few things, things there, aesthetics. So is that, you know, not using Gumby people? <laughs> <laughs> you want me to say something about those Gumby people? <laughs> Come on, be real. <laughs> no, just kidding. I wouldn't, no, I mean, really? No, I would not use them. That's all <laughs> okay. I can say. Okay, good. <laughs> Got one in the tribe. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, the aesthetics, I think, yeah, it's very important. Now, at times, it's an interesting situation because it almost seems like the business uses, the business loves the aesthetics and there's obviously have to have some substance behind that, you know, in terms of sure, sure. material being provided. Now in, in your approach to visual design, what principles do you follow? Do you come, you know, based on your art background, are you following principles that are more from graphic design or you're tied into some of the multimedia learning theory stuff like Richard Mayer? We had an episode with him here. So oh, nice. Yeah. Tell me about that. Uh, how sure. is I, because, you know, it's interesting. And the reason I ask you a question is because I, I interviewed him and it seems like a lot of his stuff is parallel with many of the graphic, you know, visual design principles that you read on as a guest style principles or things like that. So, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what, there's one thing that I didn't mention about aesthetics and it, it's a, it is a principle of visual design. That's so important. And that's inclusivity before I get into the other principles. Okay. And that means making your graphics, your photos, your illustrations look like the audience that's going to be viewing it. And they're, uh, stock photo sites need to really up their game on that. I can spend hours looking for um, photographs that make that are inclusive and that you know get everybody involved. And that's just so so important. I just want to put a plug for that. Yeah. So stock photo sites, come on, man. So you know the first book that I wrote. I don't know if you know it, Visual Language for Designers. Most people know my second book. But I wrote that a long time ago, and that was really a blend of cognitive psychology. What principles in cognitive psychology can work for visual design? And there's some really cool ones. And that's maybe I think that might have been out before. I don't know when Mayer's uh, multimedia book came out, mm -hmm. but um, so there's some basic principles of visual design that really work. And one is that work for learning purposes. Mm -hmm. So one might be um, reducing realism. And a lot of times when you need something to be understood quickly, like a diagram or um, maybe a quick animation, when you reduce the realism of it, when you make it more illustrative than photographic, there's been research that shows that that can be more quickly scanned and understood especially for novice learners. So that's, for example, one principle that I'm mm -hmm. going to use. Okay. And, and yeah, go ahead. Well, the reason I point that one out is because you might think it's the opposite. It's not intuitive, I don't think. But here's a great example for, of that one. Uh, you're trying to teach novice learners the different parts of a car engine. Well, if you do it in a photograph, it's really grainy, confusing, even if it's a a very good photograph. There are a lot of extra elements in there that may not be needed. But if you have an illustration or a 3D rendering of it that's very clean, then people can just, it makes it easier to pick out the parts. Mm, so okay. that, that's a good example of that. So if you would do, um, let's say, photographic effects like um, leaf color type of things, like changes in color, mm. um, and, you know, bring out the specific parts are being talked about. Would that not work if it was realistic or do you find that, because I seen, you know, you mentioned that and many of the designs today, they seem to be all like about flat, you know, icon animation and stuff like that still. Um, there seem to be a big, let's say, uh, impetus for that. <laughs> like uh, almost everything you see is based on that. Flat, yeah. So you think, uh, you know, in terms of using a photographic image, but actually, doing like some color emphasis in different areas, would that, uh, would that work in your eyes or do you feel you still 
you want to go with the animation? I'd have to I'd have to look at the example, um, okay. but I think it could look like a yellow outline around, let's say, a car the car engine around the part. But um, think picture in your mind a three D graphic, a three D rendered graphic, or mm -hmm. a diagram. What do you think? And you want to learn where the uh, cylinders are. What do you think would work better for you if you if you didn't know anything about car mechanics at all? Yeah, I I think it would be. It depends for me. It will be well talking to me. <laughs> for me, you as be, a novice. Yeah, me as a novice. Okay, that's a different story. <laughs> um, now it, it's hard to say. I mean, obviously, what I'm thinking about is for the instructional designer, right? Uh, what are the things I'm all about? What are the things you can do minimally and do with sure. resources and get, if not the same, almost very very proximal effect. So one of the things I used in the past is actually, let's say you have the engine of the car, right? And it's black and white. And then just that part of whatever your the cylinders is color. In other words, in this natural color or color in some overlay with a color, right? Because you know that the eyes are going to focus on that right? right. than doing something else. But obviously, you know, if you have an, a 3D animation, it will be hard to contest if you have, you know, pistons and cylinders moving and stuff like that. You see the functionality. As right. I and I mean, that's where you come from, from Flash, right? Well, you know, I wasn't necessarily talking about animation or even um, hiring an illustrator, which is awesome if you can afford yeah, that. Yeah, right. But a lot of times the stock photo sites will have vector graphics. They'll have oh, the okay. flat plane illustration. Uh, okay. And there's been some research that shows that a phase diagram, um, which means a diagram that shows a one moment of action. So you could use four cylinders of um, a piston going up and down, a four, sorry, four, fo four illustrations of a piston going up and down. And that actually might be better than an animation because an animation kind of flies by. And if the user can't control it, um, they're not going to be able to catch what it means. Right, right. So right. actually a lot of times stills are better than an animation. Oh, okay. And to get to your point, yes, if you're on a budget and you can't uh, find a vector and you can't hire an illustrator, then yes, a photograph with a, some color pointing out where the part would be would suffice. But I would guess that a vector illustration would be better. Yeah. So, uh, you know, things that... A lot of times we miss this because a lot of people tend to go for what you know is familiar, right? So like mm. instead of using arrows or annotations of sort, you know, like an arrow pointing or some kind of glow thing, um, use subtle, you know, color changes and you know uh, things like that. Uh, I find those, you know, I think those will be not only easier on the eyes, but also it makes that connection, that association of you mm. know content and imagery. Uh, especially yeah. in the sense of what the purpose is for the learner, right? Because in many ta in many occasions, you may be creating a course for passing a test, so that's a whole different, a little bit of a different game. Mm. But um, I don't know. In my eyes, I always uh, tend to. Uh, and I don't know if it's things I did when I was a kid, because I, I, as a kid, I used to like memorize stuff. Right. And that training helped me in tests, but when I take a test, I can see like you know the script in the book where I have the answer, <laughs> like in my head, sometimes. <laughs> so, right, right. So it's, yeah, one of those things, interesting stuff. Um, the, um, so, you know, obviously in, in this, you recommend that instructional designers learn like color theory uh, for, you know, what would you recommend? What would I recommend? Yeah. I think you need to learn enough visual design principles so that you can either design something well yourself or be able to speak to a graphic designer who you, maybe if you're working on a big team, you're lucky enough to have a graphic designer on staff and to be able to speak to them about a few things. And I'll tell you what a few of those things are. One would be a visual hierarchy. And that's something that graphic professional graphic designers are always going to think about. And a lot of times instructional designers haven't learned about it yet. And I teach visual design workshops back in the day when we could travel and, um, it was it was wonderful. Like people are going, oh, that's what they're that's what they're doing. And a visual hierarchy uh, allows you to control where the viewer looks first, second, and third. Right. 
So things that are at the top or extra large or very bright are going to be first in the visual hierarchy. So the instructional designer stops, thinks about what's most important. What do I want people to look at first? So it could be the title. It could be the graphic. It could be a text explanation. And whatever they want, you decide as the, gra as the instructional designer, whatever you want them to look at first, you put at the top of the visual hierarchy. So put it at the top, make it brighter, um, use bold face text. There are a lot of techniques for doing that. Mm. Those are the kinds of things um, that if instruction designers, learning experience designers learn about, their work is going to be more effective because it's closely tied to learning. So we're talking about things that are closely tied to learning. Um, another example is visual cues. That's what you were talking about before. Arrows, um, highlights, different colors if there's enough contrast. Visual cues will immediately make people look. And I tested it out on a three-year-old once and put an arrow on, on something. And the three-year-old knew that an arrow meant to look at something, was, point, was a pointer. So that means that at that young age, pe people, uh, at least uh, in our country, have, and well, okay, let's just say the West. I don't know enough about um, visual literacy around the world, so I can't talk about that. But I would say probably pretty much around the world, people have the visual literacy to understand arrows, to understand highlights, and it just draws you in. You know, there's top down and bottom up, right? And left, right. Mm -hmm. So bottom up um, processing is going to make you look quickly at anything that's moving, um, anything bright, anything that's large. And those are just important things to keep in mind when you're doing a design. Now, a lot of times instruction designers aren't doing the design, they're talking with graphic designers, and it's just wonderful to be able to talk about things, um, to use the same vocabulary that your graphic designers are going to use. They'll be really impressed. Mm, nice. Yeah, I know um, there's a great book out there, 101 Things Designers Should Know. Uh, mm, I've Dr. seen Weinstein. that. I think it is. Susan, yeah. Description, folks. We'll put it in there. But uh, one of the studies there has found that you know we we use uh, eyes. We use mostly peripheral vision rather than uh, focus on that center. So if you bring animations from the side or top bottom, as you mentioned, as those are going to get more attention than whatever you're putting in the center of the screen. So that was a a bit of an eye opener, for lack of a better pun. <laughs> I don't know about that one, so I'd have to read that and see. Yeah, yeah. I don't have an opinion uh, about that one. Yeah, check it out. Uh, so, uh, same with the um, concept of, you know, red and blue colors. Um, you know, red back, blue background on red letters. Um, causes a shimmer effect. Yeah, causes a shimmer yeah. effect. Or, you know, and color theory. Well, I don't know if it is it the same as vibration? Well, I think the problem with putting red and blue next to each other is one uses um, a certain cone in your, uh, one is a long wavelength and one's a short wavelength. I don't right. remember which. Yeah. And so when the eye is trying to process the two of them together, it causes a little bit of a shimmer. But as far as color theory goes, I don't think you have to get into it too deep, but it's nice to know what complementary colors are. So that if you look at a color wheel and you see orange here and um, blue here, you know that they're complementary. Then if you have perhaps a blue background, you can put orange on there and to highlight things or as an accent color, and that can work pretty well. It also depends on the tints and the shades. So, um, okay. So you have to think about that and look at that too, but it's nice to look at the color wheel sometimes to come up with a color palette also. It helps you find a complementary color that's going to go well with your color. Yeah, it's almost like, um, well, I, I got to tell you, though, I mean, I know you shy away from it, but people need color theory. So there's some people out there that need some color theory. <laughs> no, you're right. I'm not really saying you don't need it. I just mean you don't need to get into it super deeply. But Green like in yellow. <laughs> no, just, you know, there are, there are, yeah, <laughs> there's a, there are things called color harmonies. And yeah, it's great to know them. So complementary yeah. colors, triad. Um, nice monochromatic, you know, where you take three things from the color wheel next to each other. So yeah, I'm not saying you shouldn't learn it. Learn it. Learn it, people. Yeah, it'll make, make a difference. 
No Gumby people. Call it theory. <laughs> Alex and Connie's agenda of <laughs> better design. So in um, what's been the best design you put together that you remember? Hmm. Oh, boy. You know, some of the things that I really like to work on, I wouldn't say it's the best because, you know, I'm one of those people, whenever I look back at my work, I go, oh, yeah. I could have done this could better. Be better. <laughs> but um, sometimes I've been asked to make very complex information graphics, and they're really hard. I mean, you can be working in Illustrator for hours and hours and hours uh, until your head hurts. But um, some of those are very satisfying when you're done because it's not just a design. You're really thinking about how will people process the information? And that's really, when you come up with something that's a good solution, it can be really satisfying because you took all this data, all this information, and you arranged it and organized it until your brain hurt and to get it up to a place where people can process it. And that's, that's the kind of thing where you can never do it alone. You have to continually run it by people, usually your client or um, maybe some peers and colleagues and find out, you know, can you understand this? And then of course, if you get a chance to run it by audience members, which many clients don't like, um, you can get great feedback. So designing something like that, something complex that involves a lot of information processing is, is satisfying. In, call it. in your experience though, what was the thing that you, you ever put that one thing together, you're like, yeah, that's nice, that works. Yeah, some things like that. Sometimes just um, working on title slides for a long time. Um, I think in our field, we do not have time to super and over design. If you're, let's say you're creating e-learning every yeah. single slide. I mean, you just have to come up with some templates, some general ideas that are good, but and effective that will be effective for people. And, and often it's, you know, no ex simple things like no extraneous information. All the elements are aligned. So it's not looking crazy and all over the place. This is going to help people learn, you know, nice spacing. Um, but then sometimes I'll put a lot of effort into a very nice title slide because that's going to give people their first impression. Right. Now presentations take me a really long time to design because on, on, in a presentation, I'm working on every single slide as though it's the title. Right. And that's my own time. That's when I'm going to go to Learning Solutions or DevLearn or ATD, one of the ATD events, and, and, and speak to an audience. And that can take forever to design. What's your approach on that? Because I, I usually look at it like every slide is a message. Mm. Yeah. Every slide is a message and every slide is a blank canvas. Mm -hmm. And there's this really fine line. And I just completely get rid of the way PowerPoint does, you know, title, body text. That's like... Go right into the slide master and delete all that crap. Right. So it is a blank canvas. So there's this fine line between re repetition and making it unique. So we have to repeat things so that people don't get like um, surprised at every single slide. Okay. But on the other hand, we have to make certain things unique so that they don't get bored. If, if everything has the same pattern over and over again. So one thing I do to unify designs is I'll take a shape and repeat that. Maybe the shape is going to be a circle. So throughout, there'll be a lot of circles or three circles in all different patterns maybe. Or you're, you'll be using a consistent palette and consistent typography. So there are ways to unify it and yet vary it for interest. Okay. So in this world today, Connie, that um, we, we're landing in a specific area, right? Because, you know, we're, we're not getting any younger and um, we're not. Oh, I am. <laughs> oh you are? Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just an attitude. I got it. So just see me when I wake up. Uh, the, one of the key things, uh, Connie, is uh, today you got all these apps that can simplify a lot of the stuff. Um, and then there's still, the, you know, the artisans like us, <laughs> I'm not comparing myself with you, but I'm just saying, you know, you work from scratch or you prefer that people use things like Canva or mm. apps like that. They already have, well, basically what it is is they have the work of 
real graphic designers, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Full-time graphic designers. Professional, design. yes. And you use them. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, again, I don't have, and um, it's fine for us to compare ourselves with each other. That's fine. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I don't have any real opinion about what people use. I just think it's the results that count. And if you can come up with a very effective design that enhances and promotes learning and it's going to be good for people to process the information, not too much extraneous, then whatever works for you is good. Okay. <laughs> which kind of relates to what we were talking about before we started recording. It's like, it's not how you get there. It's what is your end result? Is it going to be effective? Are you going to motivate people? Are you going to engage them? That kind of thing. No. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's good. So, you know, wish I could talk to you forever, but you know, as you know, we'll have limitations in time and space. I really want to thank you, Connie, for jumping in here and off the cuff, joining the legendary wall of, you know, uh, people in off the cuff, Don Norman, everybody else, David Merrill, all that good stuff. Now we have Connie Malavid. Amazing stuff. What is your last thoughts here for uh, aspiring instructional designers, brand new ones that need mm. to beef up on their visual design? One thing that I always recommend to people is look around you, which we started to touch on a little bit at the start. So it's closing up the circle. <laughs> look around, um, look at your junk mail, look at magazines, look at websites. If you're on the train, you know, look at the advertisements. If you're in a place where they have billboards, look at those. See what works, see what you like and take it and make it your own. And what you don't like, make sure that you don't ever use. So learn from the world around you. Wow. Well, there you go, guys. Doesn't get any better than that. We'll All see right. what's here for this episode, the epic 75th episode of Off the Cuff with Connie Malamit. This has been Alex and Connie. We'll see you guys on the next one. Take care. Thanks a lot for having me. <laughs>